from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan, announcing show number 199, recorded live Thursday, February 3rd, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET Web Applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Craigslist developer Jeremy Zawadny. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. I think it's, in fact, episode 199. We're coming up on 200. With this episode, we are very lucky to have uh, Jeremy Zawadny, who is an employee of Craigslist and formerly of Yahoo. Uh, Thank you, sir, for taking the time to chat with me. Oh, hi, Scott. No problem. So yeah, and also thanks uh, to Craig for hooking this up. Uh, just I love the Twitter how it makes us avail- uh, makes people available. Uh, Craig was yeah. very kind uh, to uh, to facilitate this. He's uh, he seems very active on Twitter too. I follow him, and uh, he's all over the place, all over the world, doing all sorts of things. Yeah, he really he really is. So I assume that he's not sitting in the office working with you, coding Craigslist from day to day at this point. He's off being Craig. Yeah, that's right. He's uh, he's off being Craig. Although he does help out with. Uh, with customer service type stuff, uh, still a fair amount of his time. So he's, uh, he pokes into the office once in a while, but I think mostly he works remotely from home or from whatever corner of the globe he finds himself in. How many, how many people work at Craigslist? Um, I, you know, our total right now, I've got a guess is in the thirties or something. It's, it's mm-hmm. not a lot of us. I mean, it was, it was 20 or 25 for a while and we hired some people last year and, and the year before that, myself included. Uh, so we grew a little bit, but it's uh, still pretty small compared to uh, a lot of companies that, that have the kind of traffic we do. Mm-hmm. And you're the head of development, is that correct? Uh, no, I, I don't know. I, no, I mean, I, I'm not. I shouldn't say I don't know. Well, but uh, let me, let me, let me I, rephrase the question then. Um, yeah. How many developers are there, and are you all peers, or how do you kind of manage the workload? Yeah, so we're, there's, um, I mean, there's something like eight or nine of us right now, and yeah, we're all, we're all peers. I mean, we try to bring in, you know, we try to be bringing people who are, who are pretty experienced and, and, um, and don't need a lot of direction and all just work together on things, and, uh, we all report to the CTO, so, um, he's ultimately the one who's, uh, kind of helping hurt us and, and figure out what's important and what we should be working on, but, uh, you know, we get a lot of freedom to work on the, the projects that are important at any given time. And how long, how long have you been there? You've been there since, what, 2008? Yeah, um, middle of 2008, so it's uh, maybe, I don't know, a year and seven months now or something like that. Um, yeah, I left Yahoo in, in June of that year and then started Craigslist in July. Now, why, why would you leave Yahoo being such a big place where you could work on problems of a certain kind, size, scale, breadth, to work sure. at Craigslist, which I think is arguably as a narrow focus? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um I mean, a lot of it goes back to when I first got out of school. Um, I, I always sort of saw myself working in a small organization, and um, it was kind of a, a joke on myself because the first job I took out of school was to work at uh, a 40,000-person oil company. I worked at Marathon Oil, and uh, back then the, the web was all fairly new, and companies were trying to figure out what to do with it. And so I, I was there for a few years helping out with their intranet development and help launch their public marathon.com website. And... Um, then uh, I just uh, happened to see an, an ad for a uh, posting for a job at, at Yahoo in Yahoo Finance, which I, I was actually the part of Yahoo I used the most at the time. Came out to California mm. and, and worked at Yahoo when it was, you know, it started there with like 2,000 people. I was employee 20,030 or 2,036 or something like that. And wow. uh, and it just, you know, it just got bigger over time. Um, and I think a consequence of getting bigger is it gets um, more challenging to do certain things. <laughs> So uh, I was kind of looking, I'd been looking for a change for a while, and I think that change was going to uh, a much smaller organization, and, and I couldn't have got much smaller than Craigslist and still work on uh, problems that I think are as interesting as the ones I get to work on. Yeah, I think Craigslist is unique in the sense that it is absolutely kind of globally visible, but it, it sounds like a, a, you know, a boutique. There's lots of little 30-person shops uh, out there in the world. They just don't have any kind of the reach and the traffic that Craigslist does. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's just it's it's we have got a we've got a little web page we can look at internally to watch kind of all sorts of real time numbers from our servers and, and sort of our our total traffic volume and things like that. You know, I look at the the hits per second we're doing or the searches per second or the posts coming in and it's just this phenomenal number and it's 
you kind of look at it and it's like we, we what we really created is a sort of a machine that, that runs itself for the most part. We just, we're just there to give it maintenance and, and provide enhancements once in a while because it's the you know the millions of people using the site every day that really make it all work. Uh, we just we just put the, the, the bare bones infrastructure in place. What can you tell me about this about this um, the size of this uh, and and what it's written in? Kind of just give us a sense because I think a lot of people who listen to the show uh, you know, are familiar with web farms and uh, putting together many machines to do the work. Um, what 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 is this built on? How many boxes are there? Just a general sense of the the lay of the land. Yeah, we've got um, something in the neighborhood of I think 500 total servers in our in our two data centers right now. Um, we have a data center in San Francisco and one in uh, Arizona. And um, mm-hmm. the bulk of the site, um, all the front end, it, it's it's all um, probably 95% of our code is written in Perl. And uh, I'd say you know, a fair chunk of that is mod Perl code running under Apache. Um, mm-hmm. And that is all the interactive stuff that users deal with. And then we also have some uh, custom uh, services that are written, some front end, some back end services also written in Perl. And uh, we've got a few little bits of code here and there that are written in C or C++ for performance reasons, um, just because it's, it's something we really had to optimize. Or it's a third-party, you know, it's a third-party open source tool, for example. You know, MySQL is written in C++, and we use MySQL. Um, but uh, most of the code we write is in, is in Perl and, and little bits of C and C++ here and there. And mm-hmm. um, we've got, you know, we've, we've got our, our infrastructure divided into lots of different tiers, like I think a lot of other large websites do. You know, we've got our, our sort of database tier, which has lots of different clusters of databases in it. You know, we've got one for all the postings, another one for all the users, another one for our um, our images, another one for our uh, abuse metadata, and, and so on. You know, there's, there's three or four others, things like building and finance and, and, and other stuff. Um We've got a you know web server tier, of course, which has um, groups again clusters of web servers in there. We've got separate clusters for read traffic, separate clusters for write traffic, a separate cluster for search traffic, um, and uh, and then we've got a bunch of more specialized things. Uh, I think the the biggest one is our front end proxy. We don't run um, we don't run any of the open source proxy servers. We probably could. But we have an in-house written one that that uh, integrates tightly with Memcache, and we use Memcache very, very heavily to um, cache a lot of our data, uh, which helps makes it, which helps us to be very, very efficient um, from not just a performance point of view, but also from a sort of equipment and power savings point of view too. Uh, we, I remember years ago when I was going to conferences and saw someone from Craigslist. Uh, give a presentation. They would often put this, this graph up on the on the uh, presentation that showed page views per kilowatt hour. And most of the large websites fell pretty well on this this reasonable looking curve. And then the real outlier was Craigslist, which was doing like ten or twenty or fifty times as many page views per kilowatt hour. And the reason was that we we found ways to do things very very efficiently that keep our power footprint down as well. Can you can you walk me through? Uh... Of the process as someone puts a an ad on Craigslist and what's happening because there's there's kind of you know legend and mystery kind of surrounding Craigslist and you know if you visit a Craigslist post it looks like it's just static HTML being served because the URL looks like static HTML. Yeah, it does. And I've wondered about how you know how do you manage session uh, logging someone in and all that kind of authentication authorization process. You know, someone can just show up, hit post, they right. can add images. They can, right. um, you know, do a lot before they're even asked to kind of log in at that point. What, what's happening in the back end? Okay. So, um, the other, and actually the reality is people never really have to log in in some cases. Um, yeah. I, I walked through, yeah, I walked through this for a, a MySQL meetup a few months ago with a big whiteboard. So I'll try, try to do it without the whiteboard now. Um, yeah, it's a but challenge. basically when, yeah, when, when, when your browser comes to hit Craigslist, um, well, from the read point of view, um, some huge percentage of our traffic is coming straight out of cache. So you're going to hit that front end. You're going to hit a load balancer, which is going to send you to a front end proxy, um, our memcache proxy, we call it, or MCP for short. And uh, it will simply check the check the URL you're looking for and likely find it in cache and send it back to you, and, and that's it. It never, never goes deeper into our systems than that. I mean, of course, we log the traffic as well. But um, mm-hmm. on the right side, when you want to come and actually post something, you're browsing Craigslist, you hit the post link, and then you start through our posting process, and all of that traffic is happening between you, um, again, the, the front-end proxy, and then one of our Apache web servers in the write cluster handles all mm-hmm. of our write traffic. 
And what's happening is a posting process is kind of a multi-step process where you, you can put in your posting title, the dollar amount if you're selling something, the body of the posting, and then you do have the option to upload images and, and things like that. Uh, you can also walk through a, a tree of locations to decide where uh, in the geography you want your item to appear. And um, most of that interaction is happening between uh, you and that that uh, right web server, and um, a lot of the session state is being stored in memcached, and, and there's a cookie going back and forth between the browser and uh, that Apache process that's uh, handling your request. Uh, so we can we can fetch that data out of uh, memcached and and keep the state there, and uh, we don't have to. We're not persisting that in a, in a data store long term on uh, behind the scenes, so it's, it never hits the disk. And mm-hmm. what will happen is when the posting is entered, um, we will write that into the postings database uh, into a series of tables. And also the images get uploaded and get sent off to our image system. And from the front end, it looks pretty simple, and it, re- and it really is. Those, those things happen, and then, then you get a page that says, you know, thanks for posting on Craigslist. Your posting should be visible in 10 to 15 minutes or, or whatever the exact text of that message is nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, and then behind the scenes... Um, what happens is uh, some other processes get kicked off that um, help kind of propagate your posting up to the site. Uh, one of those is that uh, we have a specialized service that is we call our, our table of ten table of contents or our talks uh, daemon that runs, and its sole purpose is to facilitate very very fast browsing of the site when you're drilling through categories and kind of going back through time. Um, so it's a service that knows um, can maintains these sorted lists in memory of, of posting IDs, which is that numeric posting number that shows up in the URL and also on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, so our, our read web servers, for example, when you when you say, I want to see the most recent items in for sale in San Francisco Bay Area, uh, the read red ser- web servers will ask the table of content server for the list of the 100 most recent posting IDs in a given category in a given city, and they'll spit them back in you know a millisecond or, or whatever ridiculously small amount of time it takes. And... Um, and so with that list of IDs, the web server can then turn around and ask another service, which is we call our posting cache, uh, for all the data, metadata about those postings. And so the posting cache is a custom daemon that we have running that stores structured Perl data structures in memcache. And so, you're, so basically the web server is going to get that list of posting IDs, turn around, ask the posting cache for all that data, get that mm-hmm. response back, and then format the web page, and then you see it. Um, hmm. So that that's for to see an individual. Uh, that's to see a page of listings, and then when you want to see, that assumes the page wasn't cached because if it was cached, a proxy would have just served it to you out of cache. Right now, if you um, if you want to see an individual listing, of course you'll click on the individual listing, and the same kind of thing happens. Um, request goes to a, a, a you know through the proxy, assuming that it's not in cache, it goes back to a read web server, and that read web server has that posting ID because it was in the URL, and it uh, fires off a request again to our posting cache and says, you know, give me all the data for this posting. That comes back, um, again, on a memcache typically, and if it's not a memcache, it, it will fall back and pull that out of MySQL and then throw it in memcache and return the data. And then it's able to just render the page for you, and then it lives in cache for however many minutes it's set until it expires. Mm-hmm. Um, the, probably the most dynamic uh, interaction people will have then is on the search side. If uh, you're actually searching Craigslist, um, it's the same sort of mechanics. What happens is, you know, your request comes in, and if it's uh, if it if the URL is already cached, we serve it to you out of the cache. If not, it hits a search web server, um, and then that fires off a request to our backend cluster of Sphinx machines. So we use the open source Sphinx indexing engine for all of our search, um, and Sphinx acts just like that table of contents daemon I mentioned. Um, you fire it a query, and what it spits back is a list of these posting IDs in sorted order, and uh, the code takes that list of posting IDs, asks the posting cache for all the metadata for those posting IDs, and then renders the page using the same sort of routines for date formatting and everything else that, that, that the uh, table of contents uh, rendering uses. So what, what we have happening on the back end is there's a lot of... Um, I mean, we've got the large data store in MySQL. We've got the large memcache pools that hold all those metadata and this data in memory. And then we've got these other services that are, are sort of like loose external indexes or, or, or queryable services that can answer in terms of a list of posting IDs or a single posting ID for a request. Hey, everybody. This is Scott coming at you from another place in time. No doubt you probably bump into testing tasks now and then in your work. 
And you know writing functional tests is probably not your favorite thing. It's kind of difficult, takes time, and the results can be dubious. Well, get ready to start liking tests uh, thanks to Telerik with the uh, the new WebEye testing framework. Building web automation tests is a breeze. You've got code automation with advanced ASP.NET AJAX and Serverlight applications. You can write a single test, have it executed against multiple browsers at once. You benefit from a rich API. There's link support, integration with Visual Studio unit testing, also NUnit, XUnit, and MBUnit. Not to mention the free wrappers for Telerik RAD controls for ASP.NET AJAX and Serverlight. All shipping with Telerik's new testing tool. One of the best features, the WebEye testing framework, which is developed by Art of Test, is it's absolutely free. If you've already got hooked on WebEye testing framework, start using it right away. Go to Telerik.com for more info. Thanks a lot. At what point will this not scale? I'm sure you do capacity planning. Your your number there is up in the mid billion, you know, 1.5 billion. Uh, your posting ID number, but at what yeah. point will this? I mean, if like the entire, let's say that every single person who is currently alive on the planet, yeah, uses Craigslist. What sure. will, what will break first? Is it the is it the memcache? You'll just need more memory, or will it be the big? You know, I mean, as you you know that there are there are instances of things out there like Twitter and like Facebook that have similarly organized things. It seems to be kind of how things are organized nowadays. But I'm yeah. curious when doing capacity planning, do you just plan on all current available humans and plan from there. You know, we can do it with the entire population, then we'll be fine. I think, you know, so the uh, the kind of approach that, that I've taken and, and several of us kind of take to capacity planning is we, we look at things and, and there's really kind of two two fundamental things we want to know at a given time. One of them is uh, what is the current bottleneck? What's the slowest piece of the infrastructure? What's going to break first? Uh, mm-hmm. If things just start ramping up, what breaks first? And then the second piece is what is our typical growth rate look like? You know, as different different activities on the site grow at different rates. You know, are we doubling every year? Are we doubling every six months? Are we doubling every week? You know, things like that. Um, and, and I can give you a real world example of that. Just um, just this week, it was on Monday, Tuesday of this week. I, I've been watching. I, I deal with a lot of the search infrastructure, and I've been noticing that the number of searches that hit the back end search infrastructure is significantly higher than it was even a month ago. And I'm scratching my head going, you know, what's wrong? Is there some new bot out there that's scraping us for search and, and trying to grab all the listings or, or, you know, what's going on? And started looking at these numbers and, and, you know, grabbed the last year's worth of data, plotted it out, looked at it. Several other people who have been there longer than I have looked at it and said, well, yeah, we often get a, a big bump like this in January, and it's just kind of like the new plateau. And um, and that helped because it's like, okay, maybe there isn't some – and we, we dug into the data, and it doesn't look like there's some big new bot out there attacking us. Um, it looks like there's just a lot more searching going on. Um, so that that helps kind of set my expectations about what the growth rate looks like. Um, but the other piece of it is what's the what's the slowest part of the system, where's the most fragile piece of infrastructure? And I think that is probably the thing that we end up focusing on the most because our, we're big enough now that we're not going to be doubling every week or doubling every month or anything like like Twitter was a few you know a year ago or um, or, or some of the other sites when they go through that big growth spurt. Uh, we're in that mode now where we're definitely growing, but we're growing at a more predictable rate, and uh, and that helps a lot in the scaling process because we can we can plan ahead. We can say, well, we think we know what we need to do, and we need to have it done in nine months versus having it done tomorrow, and uh, we can try to plan and do things right. Um, our current, you know, if if everyone started using Craigslist today, what would what would happen is um, we would simply run out of steam on the database side right now. That's our single. Uh, slowest piece of infrastructure, and we're actually in the midst of doing a pretty major overhaul of our, our database backend, and uh, we're moving away from uh, database boxes with large um, rate arrays of, of SAS drives to database boxes that use solid state storage, so that we can uh, get rid of the bottleneck. And the the bottleneck that comes from having seek times that are, are actually measurable, <laughs> uh, because once your data can't fit completely cached in RAM, then the seek time on disk becomes a big bottleneck, and that's what we've been running into. So that's kind of where we're at right now. How do you do maintenance? How do you swap this out? I mean, when you're doing brain surgery on a person who's walking around and they need to keep standing up, do you bring Craigslist down, or are you going to do this in a, in a organized and bring, you know, bring one site down at a time fashion? So there's a couple answers to that question. Um, in the past, so we, we've got... We've got capabilities built into most of our code to respect a sort of a glo- couple of global flags that we can we can twiddle and you know 
with a couple minutes' notice. Um, so we, we can put the site into what we call read-only mode. In a read-only mode, what happens is people can browse the site as normal and, and searches work and all sorts of things work. It's just that people can't put new postings up. Um, so that we've actually used read-only mode uh, pretty effectively to do uh, various types of maintenance. Um, and one of the things we try to do when we're planning out maintenance is try to come up with a way to do it in the least impactful way as possible so that what we can do is say, if it's, you know, we have to add the columns to a database table is uh, what we'll do is we'll do that on, you know, one of the slaves and clone that to another slave and clone those two out to more and kind of keep spreading the new schema to all the available databases until there's only one left and that's the master. And then we have to go into uh, read-only mode in order to either alter the master or promote one of the slaves to be the new master and make that switch happen. Um, and then we have um, we have uh, you know we have the ability to turn off and on other services on the back end. Um, you know, for example, if we had to turn off images for a little while, we could turn off images for a little while. If we had to disable search, we could disable search. Um, so it's 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 exceedingly rare unless there's some major network problem that someone tries to go to Craigslist and just get, doesn't get a response or gets a server error. Um, more typically, they'll have uh, some form of degraded service if we're doing maintenance. And in the case of read-only mode, since such a huge percentage of our traffic is read traffic, uh, the end result is that most people don't even notice we're in read-only mode because we try to keep those pretty short, too. Hmm. I notice I'm, work, I'm looking at, uh, at Craigslist in other countries, and there's, yeah. there's, there's internationalization. So if you go to, like, Berlin, there's English and there's German. Yeah, but I yeah. don't see any non-English characters. That's right. We <laughs> we're in the midst of uh, one of one of several of our sort of internal infrastructure and code upgrade projects going on right now is trying to make all of our code um, UTF-8 friendly, um, and or I should say Unicode friendly. And it's a question of how we're going to do that. And mm-hmm. we've we started going down this road a couple months ago and. And we're really we're in that phase of the project right now where it's like we kind of understand what the major issues are. We're trying to scope it out and get that ballpark estimate of what we think, you know, how much work are we going to bite off if we, we decide to do this and, and what's the right way to do it. You know, so one a good example of that is as I'd written some code that would, I could point it at a database server and it would walk all the tables and find all the text columns and, and check them and give me a report of, how many rows or how many cells, right? How many how many actual individual values um, looked like Latin one versus uh, Windows 1252 uh, versus UTF-8, um, mm-hmm. and and try to get some sense of what that what that looks like. And and, and then the next thing's going to be if if we make depending on which approach we take, uh, are there changes we're going to make where we're going to start encoding certain characters that would cause um, some amount of our data to overrun the available storage because you've got a column defined for 80 characters, and if you s- decide to start encoding everything that's not ASCII as HTML entities, for example, um, mm-hmm. certain things may get so big that they blow out the available space, and then we have a, a data truncation issue, and, w- and we need to scope out some of that as well. It's not an easy project because we have a lot of code, um, and we have a lot of very organic code that has grown up over you know the 10 or 12 years that Craigslist has been around, and uh, but the nice thing is, um, many of the people who wrote that code are still around. It's just that even though they may not be proud of it, they can get into it and remember what it does and understand what it's there for. Um, but it it suffers from, I think, some of the, the same symptoms that lots of organic code bases do, which is you go back to it after a few years of using it and say, God, you know, I wish I'd I wish we'd built this abstraction layer in place here because, you know, we've got too much SQL embedded in all our code, or we've got too many different remote parts of our code base that have an intimate understanding of the structure of this one thing, and we should have wrapped it as an object so that we could change the underlying implementation when we needed to and not have to go update 15, 20, 30 different files. Um, so we're kind of we're kind of scoping that pro- process out right now, but we do have translation of the site in, in a whole bunch of languages, and actually we have more coming soon. Um, mm-hmm. There's there, We have internally, I believe, I, I don't lead our internationalization work, but I believe we have a version of the site that, that's mostly UTF-8 friendly already. Um, but uh, we're not completely there yet. What what um, causes you to put a site in the countries list on the homepage versus sticking it in slash about slash sites? Because there's a number of countries that are listed in the larger about sites that aren't listed in the, on, the, on the homepage. Sure. Um, I 
I can only speculate on that because that's not a change I'm typically involved in. Um, oh, I see. Our, yeah, so our, our CEO, Jim Buckmaster, actually um, is uh, very good at um, suggesting changes to the homepage when we need changes to the homepage. And, and often, he also goes through the process every once in a while of helping us identify which new cities Craigslist should be in. Um, so sometime in the last year, I don't remember the exact date, we, we launched Craigslist in like another 100 and 100 to 200 cities in, in, in worldwide. And so mm-hmm. we went from whatever, 500 to 700. I don't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we, we really grew the number of cities we're in. And he had been, he had been keeping track for a long time of places he thought we should be in, or more importantly, watching all the feedback and reading uh, the forums on Craigslist, uh, which is kind of a piece of Craigslist everyone forgets is there. The forums uh, actually have a, a fair amount of uh, activity going on in them. He will go in there and look for feedback, and people say, "Gosh, you know, Craigslist should be in this city." You know, I live in, I live in whatever city in some part of the country or some part of the world, and the nearest Craigslist to me is is four hours away. I wish my city could have one. And mm-hmm. um, so he looks at all that feedback, tries to figure out what's reasonable, and then we'll will kind of drop a list on us and say, "Hey, here's what I'm thinking of is is all the new cities." Or in the case of homepage changes or or changes to how things are presented, say, "Well, I'm based on feedback and and some other ideas. I'm thinking we should do this." And we'll mock it up internally and look at it, and, and if there's any debate, we'll debate it a little bit and eventually come to some sort of consensus and do it. Um, but I don't know if the motivation for putting things on the on the homepage there is to increase awareness of them or to show any sort of preference. It's you know, I'm not I don't have a lot of insight into how that process works. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see when the UTF-8 thing gets sorted out if people will keep speaking English on Craigslist. Yeah, it will. Yeah. Even the Paris Craigslist is in English uh, by default. Yeah, it is. It is. And the funny thing, in, in the case of most European languages, um, there's no real reason, there's no need for that because, uh, yeah. though we can't, we can't handle wide characters. We, we, I believe, are good with any Latin one or Windows 1252. So, um, all the accented characters for the most part work. Um, there are a couple small backend issues where things don't quite work right there, but, you know, I kind of wonder, is, is this a chicken and the egg problem? It's like if people just saw more French postings in the Paris Craigslist, would they be more apt to just post in French? Or is it primarily English natives or, you know, na- native English speakers who, who moved to Paris who happened to know of Craigslist before they got there? Are they the ones using it? And I, these are things I don't know we can you know, speculate about. But, uh, but yeah, you're right. We, I've noticed that, too, browsing around various, various cities around the world. You see a lot more English than you do whatever their native language might be. Well, it definitely brings up an interesting question around crowdsourcing in the sense of you may go to all this work to do your UTF-8 and find that no one cares because they want to speak English on Craigslist because of some perceived inertia yeah, or, or, you know, or, or it's cultural or whatever. Like I'm looking right now at a, a buried Craigslist site, addisababa.craigslist.org, the Ethiopian Craigslist site. Oh, and wow. It's, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's a wasteland. There's one job posting. And oh, when I go to geez, for, yeah. when I go to for sale, there's a Camaro, a '94 Camaro, but it's a guy named Doug from Crestwood, Kentucky. So apparently, <laughs> Doug has gotten uh, has gotten yeah. lost and has posted that he's selling his Camaro in the Addis Ababa section of Craigslist. <laughs> there's literally yeah. no Ethiopians in this section. <laughs> that, and that may, yeah, that may that may have been someone who found a Craigslist auto posting tool and decided to see what it would do for them. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I, I notice when I hover. In the corner of, of the Craigslist, there's a little tiny link that looks like, uh, there's like Craigslist and then there's a superscript that says like a country code and it links to geo.craigslist.org. What is that? Uh, geo.craigslist.org. So that link should take you to, um, a list or a page of, um, all the different places that Craigslist is available. Although. Mm. Do you, do you sniff where I'm at? Like, if I revisit Craigslist in another country, will you will you figure me out and and send me there? You know, we've. I feel really dumb for not knowing the answer to that because we've talked about doing that, but I don't know that we have that code live right now. If we we do we do use a couple of cookies, but if you come as a completely fresh user to the site, I believe mm-hmm. the default experience today is that what we do is present you with a large list. Yeah, I ask you to pick. But, um, yeah, it would, it, yeah, we've talked about the idea of, and honestly, we've kicked around a lot of ideas internally about what the future should look like, and, and a lot of that has to do with being smarter about various geo things, you know, defaulting people to the right place and, and trying to put more uh, geologic into things like searches and presentation of listings and things like that. 
Wow. So there, there is definitely a lot more to Craigslist than I, than I realized. I'm curious though, since you're such a right friendly, uh, site that you, you really encourage people to give you data, you know, you don't even force people to log in, like you said earlier, in order to give data. Isn't Craigslist just a big denial of service attack kind of waiting to happen? Is that your primary engineering problem that people are spamming you? It uh, is definitely a problem, and at various times it is our primary problem, although not all the time. Uh, we do have to deal with with people who are spamming us, and um, there, you know, if you kind of go look in the CD underworld of affiliate marketing forums on the web and things like that, you'll see folks trying to sell tools that, that spam us and things like that. So, you know, we we look at that and try to put reasonable limits in place, and it's a balance between putting limits in place that let legitimate users do the things that, that they want and need to do on the site and trying to keep the bad guys out. And it's like any other form of abuse online. It, it's sort of an arms race. You know, we we add new um, new defense mechanisms in place, and they, you know, up, they up the ante on their side as well and get smart about what they're doing. But, um, you know, the thing, the thing we probably try the hardest to um, get control of are the, the scams because... Uh, people come to Craigslist, and um, we, they people have this innate uh, desire to try to get a good deal on something. So they see a uh, a listing for something that looks a little too good to be true, and sometimes they fall for it. And, and what what's on the other end is someone who's trying to take their money, not someone who's trying to sell them a car or a vacation rental or whatever it is they're looking for. And and so we you know we try to put a lot of warnings on the website. If you browse around, you'll see warnings about you know not looking for Western Union transfers or cashier's checks and. And the, the single biggest piece of advice we give people is to, to do deals locally. You know, Craigslist is all about local transactions. So if you want to buy a car, try to do it in your home city where you can meet the person, see the car, have it checked up by mechanic, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, there's there's always some, some fraction of people out there who are looking for a great deal and um, and in the process kind of put common sense aside. And the trouble is, even if that's a small fraction of people, we have such a large volume of people that, that it's going to happen. And... Um, so we're we're trying really hard and, and always trying new things that can uh, reduce the amount of uh, trouble on the site. And you know the reality is we can we can talk about this a lot, but it, it's a it's a very small percentage of the stuff on the site, and uh, we feel like we're we're making some real progress on that too. Yeah, you know I, I don't I don't I don't come into a lot of spam. I don't see a lot of I haven't had any problems with Craigslist. I hear all sorts of nightmare scenarios, but I've been using it in Portland here. I'm in Portland, Oregon for years. Yeah, sold my car. I'm actually thinking about selling a house on Craigslist. Oh in, yeah, in the yeah. Next couple of weeks. Well, that, and that's great. And it's funny. So I've had I've, <laughs> I've had a similar experience. Um, I think I think the issue is that those of us in the tech community, and, and especially those who, who work at Craigslist, are are much more apt to hear the hear about the problems than all the success stories, because when things just work as they're supposed to, nobody nobody sees that as remarkable or unusual, and nobody says anything about it. It's when something something becomes a problem or something makes the headlines that that suddenly, and that's what everyone remembers. But the reality is, you know, there's there's millions of transactions happening every day that that people don't talk about uh, because they're just normal day to day things. Uh, you know, a great a great example of this is around Christmas time this year. I was I was getting my wife some um, some some woodworking tools for Christmas, and we went around, looked on Craigslist, found people selling things we wanted. We go look at them, and in the course of interacting with the person, we they'd usually ask, "Oh, where do you work?" And and I would say, "Oh, I work at Craigslist." And and, and the response <laughs> I got was always amazing. People were like, "Wow, really? That's that's cool. What do you do there? Craigslist is great. I've I sold things on Craigslist. I love Craigslist. You guys are awesome." And and not a single person that I've met in person been de- in dealing with in a cir- circumstance like that has said anything negative about it. So that mm-hmm. that kind of Getting out of getting out from behind the computer screen and going out and talking to real people kind of helps me um, get a more balanced view of what people really think of the site. So, well, it's 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 definitely something special. I'm sure that that Craig knows that, and you and the and the folks at Craigslist uh, appreciate that. Oh, definitely, yeah, and it's 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 neat. It's like you know we. Uh, we, we've got this great community of users out there, and we know we're doing something that people like, and, and people get a lot of value from it. And it's great that we can do this and not have to put up a lot of hoops for people to jump through. And also, it's it's great that we're in an you know our company is an environment where it's small enough and it's not bureaucratic, so that when things come up, like when when the the, uh, the earthquake hit Haiti, you know, we were having a discussion internally right away about well, what can we do to help the people in Haiti, and you know, there's a Haiti. Earthquake relief link right on the homepage now, and that went up pretty quick. And um, but we're also big enough that 
you know, we started getting inquiries from people at the State Department and, and the Obama administration saying, hey, what, 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 what can you do to help? Uh, we're, these are some resources we're trying to pull together. Can you get involved in this discussion about how other big websites can help with the relief effort in Haiti so we can get pulled into things like that at the same time? And it's, it's great because it means we're actually, we're actually capable of making a difference and we're nimble enough to able to do that without getting in our, getting in our own way, so to speak. That's very cool. Well, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking to me about what's uh, what's going on in technology at Craigslist. I really appreciate it. Oh, sure, no problem. It was uh, great to chat with you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.